Hi, my name is Daniel Blockburn, and this is the first part of the introductory lecture of soil microbiology. So what is soil microbiology? Soil microbiology, microbiology in general, is the study of living beings that are very small. How small? Below one millimeter. So the, the threshold that we define here for how big is a living uh, organism for us to consider a microbe is one millimeter. Below one millimeter, it's a microbe. Above one millimeter is considered to not to be a microbe. Yeah? So, but we also in, in, in soil this course, we're not going to limit ourselves to soil microbiology. Only we are going to talk about macro and mesofauna. We have here some images, for example, of earthworms mating. And uh, this is Erichietra worms here on the top. They are very, very important for soils and for the function of soils. The macrofauna and the mesofauna, they're hugely important. The nematodes are hugely important for soils. And uh, also non-living organisms like viruses are very important for soils also, and we're going to uh, include them on this course. But it, by definition, soil microbiology is the study of uh, small organisms below one millimeter that are present in soil environments. But why are they important? Because they are responsible for what the soil is. Without these microbes, or living beings in the soil, the soil will be completely unable to sustain plant life. So we are highly concerned on the ability of soils to perform the function of sustaining plants on this environment, to be able to sustain the growth of plants. And this involves also the cycling of nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon. So what are living organisms? How do we uh, uh, define what is a living organism or not? Because biology and microbiology is the study of living organism. So this, uh, the definition of li living organisms uh, go through these uh, five criteria that you have here listed. They need to carry out, uh, uh, need energy to carry out uh, their life processes. They are composed of one or more cells. They respond to the environment, they grow and reproduce, and they are able to maintain a stable environment, yeah, internal environment. They keep the intracellular environment stable. So if uh, any organism does not fulfill one of these, for example, viruses, they, uh, they, um, they cannot sustain uh, an internal environment. Although they, they can grow and reproduce, but they need the machinery of other li living beings to, to do this. So some of the criteria are not uh, 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 filled by viruses, for example, or prions. And so they're not considered uh, living organisms. How do we express the, the, all the diversity of these living organisms on the soil or in any environment for that being? We use phylogenetic trees like the ones you see here, the very broad phylogenetic trees that you see here on the right, which these are the built by the comparison of the genetic material, the sequences of the genetic material of these organisms. The more similar they are to each other, the closer they will be on these trees. And if they are very different from, from each other, then they will be placed uh, far apart. So by looking that these, all these organisms, they have similarities uh, uh, within them, you can speculate that they came from a common ancestor. And this is the basis of what we call the theory of evolution. Yeah? This is the basis of what we call the theory of evolution, that the diversity of all living beings in the planet are caused by the, the mutations or lateral gene transfers or the uh, um, any change on the genetic material of the organisms then subjected by selection pressures of the environment. So the fittest of the organisms will survive and reproduce more and therefore spread their genetic material uh, wider. 
So it, by doing this, this starts differentiating different uh, organisms with different genetic materials. And this is how we assume, how we think that all the diversity of living beings on the planet is generated. You know, we have common ancestors. And from these common ancestors, we have mutation, replication errors, lateral gene transfers, uh, and um, uh, these different genetic materials are then subjected to selective pressures from the environment. And one of them is surviving and adapting better for the environment than the other ones. And for, for uh, higher uh, plants and animals, it, this is very hard to see and visualize, but for microbes, this is actually happening in real time. And we can even film this happening, which is one of these videos that are very uh, illustrative of the ability of the microbes of uh, adapting to these new environments by, by mutation. So if we go here for this, uh, show this video very quickly, uh, we show here, for example, this is a, a big Petri dish which contains uh, an increasing concentration of antibiotics. And the bacteria, when they reach, this is a Nicolai bacteria, when they reach the higher concentration of antibiotics, the cells that are unable to survive there, they will not grow. But then the few ones that are able, because they have the necessary mutations, uh, they will spread to the new environment. And then when they reach the higher concentration, they will stop. So uh, this is showing in real life how these microbes are changing uh, genetically and phenotypically and adapting to these new environments and acquiring this, in this case, resistance for antibiotics. But this could be about any other trait of the microbes, whatever the environment is selecting for. So I really recommend you see this, uh, come back and see this video from, uh, this is from Harvard Medical School. And uh, check, check it out, it's, it's, it's a very nice illustrative video showing how these microbes acquire in, in real time antibiotic resistance, for example. Yeah? But these microbes are changing and these changes can be traced back to a common ancestor. They were all starting from an um, E. coli uh, colony that was grown from a single cell. So this is a very uniform, genetically uniform uh, uh, colony to start with. And this, uh, all these changes that happen afterwards, all these uh, genotypes of this bacteria that you have later on, this is all through mutations and uh, that happens on this, uh, on this Petri dish on real time. So very interesting to see. So if we, uh, based on these observations that we have, we can look and assume that all these organisms, they, you can trace them back to a common, uh, unique common, uh, a less unique common ancestor. So you can draw back these, these lines until you understand that something at the start could have been the, the, the origin of all living beings on Earth. And we know that microbes are on Earth for at least 3.8 billion years, which is right from the start when the Earth was cooling down. And um, this is, we really don't know if the, 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 the origin of this life was by accident or it came from space uh, through panspermia. There's still a lot of controversy here. Uh, there's some theories that the initial lives uh, in the planet were uh, based on RNA because of the, the very primordial uh, RNA-based uh, enzymes that we have in the cells, for example, the ribosomes. But uh, uh, regardless of how the life started, this uh, evolution is uh, tracking back how the life was changing in the planet. And we can even trace back when the big extinction event happened. And on those extinction events, there's a big selection, selection pressure where uh, uh, several organisms are extinct. And then the few ones that survive are able to create the new pool of diversity on the planet. So this is true for all living beings, and this is true also for soil microbes. And you can have, you can even make a very complex tree of life based on this, and where where you can uh, see all the diversity of living beings on the planet, and by and classify them by similarity of their genetic material, 
and how close, closely related they are to each other or not. So we have that the, the main uh, 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 organisms alive are eukaryons or prokaryons, the, 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 the bacteria and archaea are prokaryons, unicellular uh, prokaryons, and the eukaryons are all the others, the plants, the animals, the protozoa, uh, fungi, and algae. Yeah? The non-living organisms that we have in soils will also be of interest like viruses, viroids, and prions. They are very important on the ecology of soil microbes and animals and plants also. Regarding the biomass, yeah, how, how much is the abundance of each group of microbe? You will uh, see that in soils, at least, almost always bacteria will be the most abundant type of microbe. So accounting for around 70 to 80 percent usually is what you expect. From all the microbes in the soil, 70 to 80 percent usually will be bacteria, unless you have some very special situation, like when you have a, 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 a forest uh, from a similar type of tree, and this type of tree is heavily colonized by ectomycorrhiza, then micro, uh, the, the fungi could be uh, this, uh, the most abundant organism in this situation. Yeah? But the uh, uh, algae, protozoa, and viruses, these are uh, uh, present in, in very low amount. Also, anaerobic bacteria in some situations could be abundant, but most often they are not uh, so abundant. And in general, you could say that uh, microorganisms, they are representative of the majority of the biomass of the planet. Yeah? And this includes soil environments, but also water environments. They're very important in this situation. And you can, you can, it's already verified that you have a huge amount of biomass up to 400 uh, um, meters below ground. So there is in, in high depth below ground, you can still find a, a huge amount of microbes, even living inside rocks. So the, the, the biomass of microbes, right, microbes in the, the planet is absolutely huge. Yeah? And this is just like here, one, one of a uh, uh, microscopy uh, showing also some yeast with bacteria and some fungi uh, uh, together in the same uh, slide. So what are the functions? What are the things that we expect that these microbes are working? We are, we're going to talk this in depth in future lectures, but mainly you would expect that uh, uh, the microbes are working heavily on the decomposition of organic matter, the formation of soil organic matter, some type of organic matter humus on the soil is not coming originally from plants, but it's coming originally from microbial cells. The, the processes of structure and aggregation and stabilization of the structure of soil is heavily influenced by, by microbes. Uh, the nutrient cycling and environmental processes like nitrate leaching also are very important. You have that the, 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 the bioremediation, the breakdown of contaminants, it's a, a, it's a microbial process in soils, pests, pesticides, antibiotics, chemicals they are applying into the soil environment. They become food for these microbes and microbes uh, uh, adapt and uh, are able to degrade these uh, uh, foreign chemicals in soil. Uh, another hot topic on, on soil microbiology is uh, nitrogen fixation. It's a very classic uh, topic, very important for plant nutrition. So atmospheric nitrogen is highly unavailable for living beings. And only bacteria in archaea are capable of carrying this enzyme called nitrogenase. And this enzyme is responsible for the fixation of atmospheric nitrogen. Uh, also, many microbes have ecological, active ecological relationship with roots, either by enhancing plant growth as PGPR, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. Uh, uh, mycorrhiza has have symbiotic symbiotic relationship with uh, plants, but also we have pathogens in soil that attack roots. Microbes they are doing the opposite. Instead of helping the plants, they are feeding on the plants and trying to uh, use these plants as food. Yeah? So we have all the, all these different types 
uh, we have parasitic also nematodes, we have all sorts of different ecological relationships happening on the soil environment. Uh, some of the, the, the hot topics on microbiology, uh, besides nitrogen fixation, we have uh, 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 waste removal in composting or the, the ability of microbes of decomposing organic matter, mineral nitrogen transformation, rhizosphere studies, the re relationship, ecological relationship between microbes and roots, uh, soil enzymes, so not only the living microbes are important in soil, but the extracellular activity of the enzymes that these microbes produce are very important. So uh, also bioremediation, biodegradation, how foreign contaminants are degraded in soil environment, metal transformation, so heavy metals are uh, uh, important pollutants for us, and stabilization and transformation of these metals are very important, uh, they're microbial processes carbon cycling and the emission of, of, of CO2 and methane from soil environments is high, highly important. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions, methane, for example, uh, and uh, nitrous oxides also are, are very important. Uh, atmospheric pollution sciences are also heavily uh, uh, influenced by soil microbiology. Microbial ecology in general are, are very interesting to see what are these different types of microbes, their roles and interaction with each other. And subsurface microbial activities in depth, not only in the, the, the part of the soil that are affected by plants, but in, in huge depths also, there are microbial activities there that need to be considered. So uh, this is the, the first of two uh, introductory lectures. The next one is about the history of soil, soil microbiology. And I hope you enjoyed. See you next time.